Now, here are your hosts, Dominic Tavella and Michael Hartsman. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman. Today is Tuesday, February 7th, 2023. And I'm on, as always, with my partner, Dominic Tavella. How are you, Dom? Doing well, Mike. Uh, sunny Florida this evening, but, uh, but doing well. No complaints. Well, I'm not in sunny Florida, but the sun's not quite down yet. So that's a positive sign in the right direction. The days are getting a little longer, Dom. Uh, we'll take it. Anything that gets us through the winter, Mike. Well, we haven't any snow up here, which is remarkable, right? It, I think it gives the global warming people some little agita, but we haven't had <laughs> a snowflake all winter. Well, Mike, they don't they don't call it global warming anymore. They call it climate change. So Let's uh, let's get our verbiage correct. The climate is just changing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. Um, so speaking of change, great segue. We weren't. We didn't do a show last week, but I have to tell you, since last Wednesday, the market has had a lot of information to absorb, a lot of news, a lot of earnings, and it it's it's standing on two feet and it's done actually pretty well. On Wednesday, the Fed um, raised interest rates 25 basis points. And then, of course, Jerome Powell was interviewed. And as as you like to say, the last two times he was interviewed after a Fed meeting, he punched the stock market in the face. That's pretty descriptive. That did and not, I think pretty accurate, Mike. I <laughs> pretty think accurate. Pretty accurate. <laughs> he must have heard you because that did not happen this time. The market responded favorably to his comments. And then, you know, Friday morning, we had this really incredible un- unemployment number, Dominic. And then, you know, the upside down world we we live in, good news was bad because, because that strong unemployment number gave the market some jitters. You know, when will they, when will they, you know, will they stop raising interest rates sooner than we anticipate? Will we have a recession? Will there be a soft landing? You know, so the market sold off a little bit on Friday. And then here we are today. Jerome Powell has this interview that gets covered by the business media. And again, he was pretty benign in his comments. And today, lo and behold, the S&P was up one and almost one and a half percent. And the NASDAQ was up two percent, which is a great one day rally. So we have a great guest this evening, Lauren Goodwin from, from New York Life. She's a director of multi-asset solutions and a CFA to help us try to make sense of all this. But geez, Dom, there's a lot going on in a short period of time. And I even mentioned corporate earnings. Uh, Mike, uh, we always, uh, sometimes tongue in cheek, but we always talk about the roller coaster ride. And you look at this day on Wednesday last week where, you know, we really thought uh, uh, Powell was going to do it again. And uh, the short term, uh, as the news was coming out, the market had this, the Dow, let's talk specifically about the Dow, had this really significant plunge. I think at one point it was down about 500 points. And then he started opening his mouth. And that usually makes the situation worse. It actually, he was very dovish. He was kind of soft in his tone and his approach. And the market took that as a positive and it went way up. And then as you brought up, uh, the employment numbers on Friday, which uh, showed about 500,000 jobs being created, which is just an astronomical number. It was so blew the estimates out of the water. And the market reacted negatively to that because that means the Fed could continue raising interest rates longer, higher for longer. And then as you brought up again today, uh, he was in one of his speeches, interviews, uh, was dovish again, and the market reacted positive. So you try to making investment decisions day to day to day to day. You, you, you literally, if you don't get nauseous, then then something is wrong. So you know we, you have to look at this in the bigger picture. And I think Lauren's going to help us do that. Uh, what do we expect the balance of this year? Uh, um, and with interest rates, with corporate earnings, maybe give us a better handle and trying to look at this thing much higher up and not get caught up in a day-to-day noise. It can drive you nuts. The day-to-day noise can just drive you nuts. Well, and to your point, the, the, the person who interviewed Jerome Powell today, and I don't know who it was. I just know his first name was David. They obviously knew each other and had a rapport. Jerome Powell was at, I think, the Economic Club or something like that. And he said on your in your interview on Wednesday, you use the expression disinflation 11 times. 
I mean, they, they literally count how many times the, 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 the Fed chief uses an expression. Uh, um, and, and listen, somebody was counting because they knew. Um, and, you know, Powell in his defense said, well, you know, uh, uh, disinflation in the context that inflation is not going up as much, right, or as bad as they had thought it's starting to roll over. And overall, even though inflation is still increasing, it's just not increasing as much. And that's a positive. It means that they can uh, maybe stop raising interest rates over the next month or two and then maybe look at what happens towards the latter part of this year. And that obviously has huge economic implications, um, including this idea that we may or may not go into a recession. And obviously that affects the markets, your interpretation of that affects the markets. But we have gotten off to a very good start so far this year, Mike. And listen, after the the rude uh, awakening the market gave us last year, grateful at least to start the year on a positive. So to your point, and I'm glad you mentioned it, year to date, Dominic, the S&P is up 7.86. This is through Friday, February 4th, I guess. Um, The February 4th. Um, The Dow Jones is up 2.44. And the NASDAQ is the biggest winner, up almost 15%. And here's what's really amazing. It's always, people always talk about when you get in the market. So in spite of the fact that the market went down 18% last year, over a one-year period, over a 12-month period, the market's only down 6%. So what that tells you is the market went down a lot in the beginning of the year, sold off quite a bit, and then this kind of hovered and then went down a little bit towards the end. But between lopping off last January and plugging in this January, the numbers don't look as horrific as they did when we did the show the last week of 2022. Yeah, and Mike, uh, uh, let's let's stress that all these numbers could change tr- pretty dramatically over and they the do. month or two or three, mm-hmm. and they usually do, right? This is that roller coaster ride that that uh, we've seen, you and I have seen for decades, right, Mike? We're used to it. We, we think it's quite normal. Um, but investors who maybe haven't seen one of these in a long time, um, you know, they sell at the bottom, right? Classic sell at the bottom. They look to to park the money uh, in ultra conservative or fixed income or or money market, which I'm not saying is a bad idea, but they then wait till the market recovers to put the money back in. So you sell low to buy high, And that's often what we're trying to advise clients. Hey, take the longer term view to this. The highs and lows kind of average out. They kind of blend out and you'll 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 achieve a reasonable rate of return and hopefully achieve your goals. Exactly. And just to be clear, those numbers were through Friday, February 3rd. Um, So, look, let's take a quick break. Our audience doesn't want to hear from us. I want to hear from Lauren. So let's take a quick break, and we'll, we will be right back with Lauren Goodman, Goodwin, sorry, CFA and Director of Multi-Asset Solutions at New York Life. .com. Now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman, back with Dominic Tavella, my partner, and our guest this evening, Lauren Goodwin, ch- Chartered Financial Analyst and Director of Multi-Asset Solutions at New York Life. Good evening, Lauren. Hi, good evening. Thanks so much for Welcome, having me. Welcome, Warren. Glad to have you back. So, Lauren, you heard our conversation and, you know, Dominic and I trying to make heads and tails of just the news cycle from the last four days. Um, any thoughts on, on on you know, what we talked about or could you help us make a little bit more sense of uh, what we were discussing? Absolutely. Well, um Let's start by just acknowledging that four days do not an investment future make, right? Or a financial future make. Um, and so it's important to put the the four days in context of, you know, the 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 bigger picture. I think um from my perspective, and we can dig into any of these topics deeper, but the economy is starting to slow. The consequence of what the Fed calls long and variable lags of its policy. Um and we are likely this year to be caught between narratives of, hooray, the Fed is pausing its interest rate hiking cycle soon, and, oh no, 
the reason that they're pausing is because economic growth has convincingly turned over. And right now, the narrative that's driving the markets is is the the, the former the o, the OEA um, the the Fed is nearing its terminal rate. We're almost done at least for now with this Fed rate hiking cycle. Um, what confuses me about the market is why that's a dovish message when we've already seen interest rates move significantly higher and we're likely to see them move higher still. But but there is a benefit of having a line of sight on the Fed's. Uh, the Fed's recent hawkishness. Now, because the um, Fed pause narrative ha- or the soft landing narrative have been driving the markets over the past four or six weeks, we've seen essentially all the things that struggled last year when the market narrative was around Fed hiking do a lot better here in the first part of the year. That's, you know, international equity, it's growth equity, it's high yield bonds. And lots of high beta or what we call cyclical asset classes, the things that tend to do well when the growth story has shifted towards the upside. Um, But again, if indeed the Fed is getting close to pausing, say after one or maybe two more interest rate hikes, it'll be because it sees convincing evidence that the economy is rolling over. And so um, again, I think we'll be stuck between those narratives this year. And and, um, while we can um, try to decipher signal from noise it's it it late cycle investing is hard it's a confusing environment which is why we we work with folks like you uh lauren i i I actually want to agree that i'm equally as perplexed as you are maybe more so um the fed's own projections for first second third quarter gdp slightly up first quarter negative gdp in the second and third quarter. This is their own forecasting. So they're they're basically projecting a mild recession uh, in the middle of this year. Um, and yet we have uh, somewhat euphoria in the markets. Uh, seems seems like the two pieces don't make sense. I think it's a matter of uh, of timing. You know, there's a of course, many different things that can in, impact the markets, but the two major ones are uh, multiples, the time value of money, you know, where interest rates are. That's all the same thing, by the way, for our, for our listeners. Um, and then the and then earnings, you know, the, the, the money that companies are making that, that are able, the, the, the fundamentals that are able to, to drive different securities forward. And uh, the story, again, that's driving uh, the positivity today is relief from this interest rates are only moving higher narrative that we've been faced with over the past year or so. Um, now, uh, I received it in my email inbox today a really... Uh, you can call it confirmation bias because I happen to agree with it, but some snapshots of uh, of different news articles in 2007 and 2008 saying, you know, Fed predicts a soft landing, you know, investors position for a soft landing. We've been here before. Um, and, and while, um, again, it can be a bit confusing when we're seeing some really challenging economic data, but, you know, a positive market environment, at least very recently, and also some positive market data, right, or economic data. We've seen, you know, the labor market is still really strong, et cetera. Um, And, but even though this economic cycle has been so different in many ways from others, the economic data is actually evolving in a very similar way than as it tends to do in any other economic cycle. And that I said earlier that late cycle investing is hard. It's because we're caught between, if you think about the, the economic cycle evolving like dominoes, we're caught between some of the earlier or leading indicators in those dominoes and then the lagging ones. So as the economy starts to slow, it tends to be interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy that that topple or, or struggle first. So that's sectors like housing. Then you'll see the manufacturing sector struggle, then services, and then the consumer and the labor market at the very end. In fact, nine out of the last 10 recessions, there was jobs being added in the economy until we were already in recession. And so the fact that we've seen you know, some struggling in housing, some struggling in manufacturing, starting to see some struggling in the services sector, but the consumer and the labor market still look good, 
of course, I don't want the labor market to struggle, but that to me isn't necessarily comforting. I do expect that we'll continue to see economic growth slowing. And again, that this market narrative of relief that that we're feeling will turn out to be to be short lived. Now, I, 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 I've I been talking a little bit too long, but I do just want to say that that doesn't mean there aren't investment opportunities out there. We actually see plentiful opportunities, especially because, gosh, 10 years, we haven't seen yields coming out of anywhere. And so it's exciting to see um, a, a change in the macro environment that presents those opportunities. But we do have to be mindful that slowing growth ahead is pretty likely. So I want to get to the opportunities in a minute, but I just want to give you a follow-up question or ask you a follow-up question. Um, people like Janet Yellen and Jerome Powell, they don't say anything by accident. I, I think everything we hear from them is fairly measured and fairly calculated. So I saw a headline over the weekend that Janet Yellen said that she's a treasury secretary, as you know, obviously, um, that it's very hard to have a recession in an environment of full employment. So she's a really smart lady. So, and we're not in a political, we're not in an election cycle. So what would motivate someone like Janet Yellen in your opinion, to make a comment like that? Well, we're not in a recession yet, right? Every every recession is a soft landing until it isn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that's squarely on Janet Yellen's shoulders that is not on the Fed's shoulders is the dynamic that we're seeing or likely to see ahead um, with battle over the debt ceiling. And while, and, and we can get into that a, a, a little more, but, um, while we don't expect a um, the U.S. to default on its debt or a major topple over the debt ceiling, we do expect there to be some brinkmanship involved, and there's a cost to eleventh hour brinkmanship. Um, it can we we've seen in the past that it can considerably influence in in a negative way consumer and business um, optimism. Uh, because people get concerned about, you know, what the government's doing. It becomes, you know, front and center, not just in the news, but also in, in, in market activity. And so even without a major mishap, there are costs to that battle, which we know is coming here in, in the next couple of months. And so um, if I'm sitting in in, in um, the Treasury Secretary's shoes, it it's really challenging to know or expect that that's coming when you're also seeing economic growth slowing. And so if if you can say something that can provide a little bit of, of comfort and, and just acknowledge that we're not in recession yet, that the you know economic growth, real GDP growth is still 3% in Q4 of 2022 um, and, and potentially offset a, a bit some of the, the, the risks or, or negative sentiment that might be coming down the line, I think that could make sense. Lauren, we keep we keep using the word recession and economic recession, but what is the probability of more of a earnings recession? Uh, we've seen earnings come in so far this quarter; they have not been horrible, um, but they've been averaging about five percent lower than analyst expectations, which had already been lowered. Um, so, what's the likelihood that maybe just corporate America doesn't make as much money, uh, at least through the balance of this year? I, I think it's I think it's highly likely, and I will just add that some of that isn't a bad thing. Now, what do I mean by that? Part of top line earnings, so just the the uh, revenues that companies take in before you take out taxes and depreciation, all their costs. Part of top line revenue has been coming in a little bit because inflation's coming in a little bit. So the growth of earnings is, you know, if you add seven, eight, nine percent inflation on top of it, will look a lot higher than if you only have five or six percent inflation on top of it. So part of the story is actually constructive. Inflation is coming in a bit, and that means that companies are also uh, likely to need to pass on less of that inflation as well. So there is there is a little bit of positive news under the underneath the surface, but I do expect that overall demand will uh, continue to slow as it has started to slow. Actually, you, you mentioned that um, there have been fewer earnings beats and guidance from, from companies has been moving lower. Actually, sequentially lower over the past six quarters. And when I mentioned those economic dominoes, of course, we're paying very close attention to what's happening with the U.S. consumer because that's what drives 
so much of company earnings. It's what drives 70% of the U.S. economy. It's so, so important. And while there has been so much support and resilience for the U.S. consumer over the past couple of years, we see that, you know, savings rates are starting to go back up, meaning that people are starting to get a little worried. We see credit card um, balances and defaults starting to rise. We see really early signs that folks, especially in the lower and lower middle income segments of the economy, are starting to struggle a bit. And that is one in which I expect earnings to continue uh, to continue to slow. Now, historically, we know that as economic growth slows, and actually as we, if, if, if we were to move closer into recession, it takes until about then for the markets to really reflect that that downside in earnings. And so I'll acknowledge that while we see earnings um, underperforming in, in across the board in this quarter so far, the market hasn't necessarily reflected that yet, right? No, in uh, fact, the multiple in the markets has gotten, uh, again, levels that we didn't see pre-COVID. Exactly. And so, again, it's, it's, it's for, for me, it's about this shift between a market that's been driven by the interest rate story in the economy. That's why the, the outperformance you've seen has been more in growthier international aspects of, of the equity markets um, and, and likely, again, liable in the second half of the year or as economic growth slows. That earnings story, I believe, will become more important. So to your point, um, with the S&P being up about eight and the NASDAQ being up about 15. Do you feel like the market's gotten a little ahead of out in front of its skis at this point? That is my perspective. Yes. And again, you know, the, the idea that the interest rate environment is becoming more predictable is good news. I have a lot of sympathy for that narrative, but what I, what I, where I think the market may be getting ahead of itself a bit is that the Fed's actually been remarkably consistent about what it expects to do over the next couple of months. You know, 17 out of 19 Fed governors in December projections expected that we'd hike two more times from here. So reaching a terminal rate of five to five and a quarter percent. Um, that message, although there were lots of other messages shared in Chair Powell's press conference last week, that message was reaffirmed. And so if nothing else, the Fed hasn't become more dovish. Does that make sense? You know, the Fed mm-hmm. hasn't. If hasn't... you actually listen to what they said, and I don't care about his tone and his mood on that particular day, the, the verbiage, the words coming out of his mouth haven't dramatically changed at all. That's it. That's well, that's 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 very much my read of of the circumstances as well. And so, again, I, I see this as being what we call an investing. I'm sure you're you're familiar with the term as well as a head fake. Um, you know, it's been last year was a really tough year. Investors are looking for ways to add value. Um, they're looking for relief. And so if Chair Powell says, you know, seven key words in the right order, then, you know, we see a positive market day. And so I do expect that that we will see a reversal of some of those trends here in the coming weeks and months um, as you know, it becomes, I, frankly, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already with the jobs report we received on Friday, which I think affirmed the Fed's message that the work, their work is not done in order to bring the, the risk of a wage price spiral under control. So Lauren, let me ask you this, and this may, to use Dom's word, this may be a bit of a wonky question. You know, when the market moves like this, this is not 20 years ago where it's day traders sitting in their basement. These are really smart people who are you know are managing billions of dollars most of it's computer generated you know i think 80 or 90% of the market these days is institutional trading firms like yours at new york life but are these traders literally that transactional that they are they even hanging on every word that the federal reserve says well look i think for starters, uh, don't underestimate the retail investor. We learned that in the in the meme stock um, mm-hmm. environment of the of of 2020 um, and 2021. But um, you know, every investor, including institutional investors, have a benchmark that they have to beat. Mm-hmm. They have an outcome that they need to achieve. And last year was really challenging for outcomes. We we do tend to see, if you look across history, years when you have a big upside surprise in inflation and or interest rates, they tend to go together. But when you have a big upside surprise in interest rates, bonds and stocks both lose at the same time. Correlations increase. That's what we saw last year. And in that type of environment, 
folks, you know, even institutional investors have to add value to their clients. They want to make up for some of the lost time and, and you know, encourage folks to stay invested in pursuit of their long-term futures, not just one year or this year or that year. And so there's a lot of fear that if a rally like we've seen in the last five weeks passes you by, then you miss the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so I'm actually seeing even among institutional investors, much more tactical um in investing happening here in these really uncertain moments, a, a reliance more on active managers as opposed to passive managers, because the these market narratives may only last a couple of months at a time. Lauren, we're coming up on, on a break, so I apologize for asking the question. Uh, uh, hopefully you can give me a quick answer. But you mentioned retail investors, and we're seeing some of the speculative fever that went on uh, over a year ago. Uh, I won't mention names, but a company that basically said they're going to file for bankruptcy missed their interest payments on their debt, and the stock goes up 80% in a day, um, and then down another 40% the next. They, it seems like the retail investor maybe hasn't learned their lesson uh, from a year ago. You know, there's not, I, I will say there's not a whole lot I can say about that other than that, you know, for, for folks, for investors who do like to have, whether it's a pet project or a, a, an investment idea that they really believe in, um, it, it can be interesting to see how those play out. But you always want to take just a very, very, very small portion of any investment money into pet ideas and, and mostly focus on, again, long-term goals, what you're really trying to achieve with your investments. Fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. You know, don't uh, don't get your hopes up on the company that sends giant coupons to your house three times a week is what you're saying. Without so, mentioning names. Exactly. On that note, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back with Lauren Goodwin. Um, now, back to the Labenthal Report. All right. I'm Michael Hartsman back with Dominic Tavella and our special guest this evening, Lauren Goodwin. Chartered Financial Analyst and Director of Multi-Asset Solutions at New York Life. So, Lauren, this happens every year where the sectors change places. Last last year's darling energy, no one wants to own it this year, right? But if I, if, if, and that happens all the time. That's not unique to 22 and 23. But if I look at the performance through last Friday, the consumer services sector, the communication services is up 21%. Consumer discretion is up 17. Technology is up 10. Healthcare is down 2.3. Energy is down 2. And consumer staples are down 1.5. So we touched before about a recession. If you look at the, the, the top sectors in the S&P and the bottom sectors, at the moment, as we sit here tonight, this is not a market where anyone's expecting a recession anytime soon, because if we were, wouldn't healthcare, energy, and consumer staples be on top, not at the bottom? That's I well. First of all, I completely agree with the premise, which is that the market is has taken has eschewed the twenty twenty two narrative of Fed hikes and recession and grabbed on or leaned into this new narrative of soft economic landing. And we've talked a little bit about you know, the Fed getting closer to its terminal rate as being a part of that. But you've also seen important upside surprises in Europe, warmer winter, less energy risk than we thought might be the case, China reopening after a, 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 a stint of zero COVID policy. And so we've seen some some meaningful upside surprises to the global economic growth story. And, and that is fueling this sort of soft landing narrative that's taken over the market. But again, and, and, and that's reflected in the sectors that, that you identified. I do expect that this is temporary. And so we are using, we, we ourselves are using the opportunity to, you know, think about the full year and say, you know, if some of these sectors that I think are likely to outperform as economic growth slows are cheaper now than they were six weeks ago, I like that. They're starting to get expensive. So I like that. I I like that as an opportunity. And again, I'm speaking in tactical terms. Not every investor can, you know, make changes um, on, on such a tactical basis, but that's part of why we're trying to think for the whole year. And as I mentioned, if, if, you know, late in the economic cycle, if we're liable to shift between these narratives of soft landing or maybe slowing growth, soft landing, slowing growth, then that's one where I'm I'm looking for more resilience. 
You know, what are the the sectors, the asset classes, the opportunities that build resilience against some of the volatility I, I think we should expect in this confusing economic environment? So, Lauren, picking up on, on what, what Mike said, um, the sectors he described as being down, I think most of us in the industry would call those value sectors. And the sectors that are doing well this year are growth. And as Mike said, that was the exact opposite last year. But value way outperformed growth last year. And we were told a year ago, this is it. This is now going to be the decade that value finally outperforms growth after a decade of growth outperforming value. So this was going to be a buy your value stocks. You'll be fine for a decade. That seemed to have lasted for about a year uh, and, and maybe a day if you count this year. Uh, what are your expectations going forward? Are we finally back into a decade or at least the balance of this year where I, value does outperform growth? I think so. Look, I, I, I think that, I mean, in addition to what we've already discussed, part of the uh, investors hold on growth equities has to do with the last decade was a was an absolute winner for growth. You know, you saw low, stable inflation growth and in interest rates. And now we're in an environment where rates are liable to be higher, at least restrictive for the next several years. Inflation liable to be a little more durable as well. Growth looks liable to be volatile, economic growth that is. And that's an environment where I expect value equities to outperform. They they deliver on several of my favorite themes for a you know choppier economic environment, defensiveness, quality, and income. And that quality piece I think is really important because sometimes you know, the value equities for listeners that maybe aren't as as familiar with the term are stocks the the idea between behind value investing is to pick stocks who are underpriced relative to what you think their long-term value might be and sometimes things are just cheap for a reason so it's really important to pick stocks that you think are undervalued actually relative to where they should be as opposed not to not just to, cheap right not just cheap um and so uh Real estate, utilities, staples, healthcare, these these value uh, sectors that you that you identified tend to be more resilient in downturns in terms of their cash flows, um, tend to be positively correlated with inflation um, and outshine growth when it comes to earnings variability. They tend to have more stable um predictable earnings. But I will say, you know, for a, for most investors, for a structural equity allocation, we say value growth a little of both. Um, it, you know, th- over the long term, having some exposure to each of these tranches makes sense. But I will say a, a couple things. First, over the last decade, as we discussed, folks allocated more and more to growth equity relative to value. So there's probably some rebalancing that's need that needs to be done for some investors, especially if you set it and forget it and just let price returns uh, do your work for you. You would be more allocated to growth and, and a few very specific U.S. names as a result of that. So that's one area where where we think some rebalancing may be important, but also the, the growth equity complex is one that has seen tremendous outperformance over the past couple of years. So uh, 2020 and 2021, when we were all sitting at home um, needing to, to use the services that these companies provided, and in many cases, pulled several years of growth forward. And so within the growth complex, we're really looking at companies that can maintain the, maintain their cash flows, provide reliable revenues, and that's an that's a lower proportion of the growth complex than a few years ago because so many companies pulled some of their growth forward, and so it's only going to be the innovators that are going to be able to to add that that long term portfolio value, and so. We're strongly overweight value equities in our portfolios. I'm bought into value as the the. Um, the the style the equity style box of the next decade, um, and but for folks who I acknowledge are going to be have a little bit of balance in their portfolio, we just advise some some caution and and a close eye to the fundamentals of the company even in the growth space. I'll tell you right now, Lauren, that is music to Dominic's ears. That's that big smile on his face, um, because we've been we we've been patiently waiting for the for the value to come back in favor with our models because we do think that the market's got a little ahead of its skis 
Um, let's switch gears for a minute. It's a big world out there. I know in the note you put out on Monday, you touched a, quite a bit on international, and that seems to be a sector that's been overlooked and ignored that you feel should get a little love going forward. Yeah, you know, uh, another just like value has been underappreciated over the last decade. International equity has has been under allocated to um, recently as well, um, and the you know the international. Uh, space has been getting a lot more love here in the last couple of weeks, but in, in part because of some of the um, upside growth surprises that that we described with Europe, with China, et cetera. Um, however, for U.S. investors, as we are, um, it, it, the main issue driving the continued outperformance of international equity, whether it's developed markets, emerging markets, is what happens with the dollar, the US dollar. And one of the real tailwinds to international equity over the past six, eight weeks here has been the dollar has been weakening. Why has the dollar been weakening? Because the market has caught on to this soft landing, Fed's gonna pause and you know, who cares about monetary policy narrative. And as I mentioned, I'm not so convinced that narrative is gonna stick around. And so I do expect as economic growth slows, Fed hikes a couple more times. We're going to see the dollar perhaps not strengthen to where it was at its peaks last year, but but reverse a little bit. And that's an environment where you know, as 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 global investors, we're we're uh, we're essentially neutral on international markets. Acknowledge the upside growth risk, but a little worried about where the dollar is going to go over the course of the year. And so one of the things that we do um, because much like many investors are balanced with some value and some growth equity, many investors have a small or, you know, small-ish allocation to international equity as an opportunity to capture when you do have these upside surprises or just some diversification uh, against um, potential challenges in the U.S. markets. So in those, um, with those opportunities, um, or to, to capture those opportunities, we consider uh, partially hedged international equity strategies as a way to sort of allow for some of that diversification benefit, but acknowledge the the challenge of the dollar. Um, but that's sort of where I stand. We, we, across our asset allocation, are neutral relative to our benchmarks um, in, in international markets. What percentage of your portfolio do you think uh, the average investor should have in international exposure? Now, should is a really strong word. But of a of a hundred percent equity valuation, whatever that size that sleeve is in a portfolio, we see as a as a standard around twenty percent of of a portfolio allocated. You, to you would agree the average American investor is way underweighted that number, right? I mean, yes, if they have the any moment. international exposure at all, um, it would be way underweighted that number. After the last ten years, yes, I would agree that even if even if um, even if investors just again, set it and forget it. 60, 40 portfolio 15 years ago, they'd be, they'd be under significantly underweight international equity relative to, to that benchmark. So Lauren, the, the second largest economy in the world is still considered an emerging market in China, right? So when you look at international, do, do you also now split it between developed and, and emerging market? And then the next question would be China sending this balloon across our land over the weekend. Does that affect your outlook on 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 China? Now, um, first of all, yes. Uh, we treat international developed markets and emerging markets separately in our asset allocation. We analyze them separately, and frankly, even treating international developed markets as a complex. Japan, Europe. Australia, Canada, they have such different drivers mm -hmm. of their economies. Same for emerging markets. China, so different from Turkey, different from Russia and Brazil. And so even those two buckets are, are, are a bit of a, of a misnomer in terms of their, their economic drivers. But yes, we do treat them differently. And so we do think a lot about um, what's going on with China. Now, the the balloon uh, over the past uh, few days, um, I do think is important to a global in investing narrative, but not necessarily one specifically about China. Now, let me explain. China is such a small proportion of any investor's international 
or even total portfolio certainly, but even international portfolio relative to to, to some other other countries. It's really um, a small allocation. But also, the re one of the key reasons that China is considered an emerging market has nothing to do with its size or its income, but rather the maturity of its financial markets. It is it is a it is very difficult to have direct access to Chinese companies, and onshore shares in China are directly controlled by the government. So you're getting a proxy of investment to China anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's happening with the balloon? Not not changing that super quickly. But one of the investment narratives that I do think is really interesting is the is the one of just growing friction between the U.S. and China. This predates the pandemic. Remember trade wars? Um, we that used to be one of the only things to talk about, and times have changed. But the pandemic brought attention to just how vulnerable any one supply chain could be because uh, you know, globalization had focused on efficiency, cost efficiency and process efficiency over the availability of products and services in a time of need. That is um, being exacerbated in, in this environment. And so one of friend shoring, likely to be modestly inflationary on average, uh, the, the, the moving of certain capabilities to the US or to friendly, uh, countries, the infrastructure investment that that's going to involve, those are investment themes that I think are are really interesting for investors to try to leverage. Don, Laura, I'm going to try to squeeze in one more part. question if I can. Um, and we haven't talked about bonds, interest payments, and and where they are today. As a balanced uh, portfolio uh, manager, we like the idea that we're actually getting paid real interest on our bonds, whether it's municipal, corporates, clients can earn a real rate of return. I'll give you the last uh, uh, comment on that whole scenario today. Oh, completely agree. Uh, since we only have a couple seconds, I'll say um, I think it's reasonable that many investors say this is the year of the bond. Yield, there is yield uh, back, and if you expect price volatility across asset classes, then a higher yield in high yield bonds, for example, or uh, diversification benefit of municipal bonds can can be very attractive um, relative to even equity risk. Um, where there's price volatility, but a lower yield, that has not been the case for a very long time. And so it's something that certainly as we're thinking about rebalancing in 2023 and new opportunities, the fixed income uh, portion of a portfolio is uh, is taking space in a way that it hasn't in quite a long time. And rewarding investors. Yes. Lauren, thank you for your time. As we said in the open, we could have had you on for an extra hour at least. I know, I know we, we got to run and hopefully we'll have you back down the road. It's Thank my you pleasure. So much, Thanks Lauren. so much Looking for having to, to At Labenthal.com. Now back to the Labenthal Report. All right, I'm Michael Hartsman back with a quick wrap up with Dominic Tavella. You know, Dom, Lauren did a great job. And, and I think a constant theme tonight was headline risk and what to do with headline risk and how to decipher headline risk. I mean, you know, this Chinese balloon that flew over the, the U.S., it really had no effect on the market. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, because that's the type of story that gets the media all up into a lather and could spook investors. And 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 I'm, I was happy to see that the, that didn't happen yesterday and today. And, and sorry, Mike, I snuck in yet. In there, and and hope to God it doesn't, right? But you know, if they find a whole bunch of equipment that measures humidity in, in Montana, nobody cares. And all right, sorry, we shot down your balloon. They find out a whole bunch of equipment that has listening devices and and high uh, resolution cameras, and clearly was a spying um, uh, element to it. Then uh, you know, it creates an international event. And uh, I'm not saying that that. Uh, it would necessitate, I can't say that word, um, it would create a, a scenario of war. But on the other hand, uh, clearly, uh, there would be some ramifications, maybe economic ramifications. So we do have to pay attention to this stuff, Mike, and, and, and see where it leads and maybe be reactive a little bit with our portfolios. But it, it's clearly the headline risk that we allude to yeah. all the time. And to your point, and Lauren mentioned it, if we think about the trade wars that we had before the pandemic, um, you know, I, I I had a couple of friends and clients who are in the in the tech industry. 
One guy is a, a buyer of semiconductors. And that trade war was real. I mean, the, the price of semiconductors at the time went through the roof. Well, so you're not, here's you're a dirty right. secret, Mike. Hold on, interrupt you. It is that you know we know Trump imposed some pretty significant tariffs uh, against China. They have not been relieved. The Biden administration very, very deliberately has not taken those tariffs off the table. So they still exist. I know. And, they, and, and, and you know, this type of event might motivate them to tighten them even more that's my point or you know china made this comment that we're not you know we we there will be ramifications so you know this is a two way street as well think about you know they they and i'm literally making it up here but you know they could take economic uh, uh ramifications against a tesla or an apple or a starbucks uh which are major us companies producing uh, manufacturing and selling in uh, in China, and that theoretically would have economic and slash a uh, stock market effect here. And 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 just to switch gears for a minute, you know, between now and the spring, early summer, we're going to hear more and more and more about the debt ceiling. And in the headline that basically puts a knot in my stomach, is that the government will let the treasury market default, and logic dictates that that will never ever ever happen. Right. But Dominic, as sure as I'm sitting here tonight, we're going to see those headlines. Oh, for sure, Mike. Look, uh, both parties have said they will not let a default happen. They've been adamant that they will not let a default happen. But guess what? They will bring us to the edge oh, and yeah. they will scare the living daylights out of most of us uh, and potentially the world markets. Right. So. It's going to be a lot of showmanship, uh, and hopefully it, it, it doesn't happen, uh, you know, end in a negative way. Uh, God willing, it won't. I think there'll be a lot of volatility in the meantime, Mike. You know, and again, just to get back to the, com the interview Jerome Powell did today, he kind of looked in the camera and said, the Federal Reserve cannot solve Congress's problem. There is nothing we can do. And, and Mike, you know, it looks like I get to use my favorite word. Um, there have been some really wonky proposals that the Fed could do this or do that and kind of bail out the Treasury uh, uh, with regard to this debt ceiling. And and I think justly so. Powell's like, yeah, that, that's not going to work. We're not getting in the middle of this fight. You guys be the adults in the room and figure it out. And I think they can, but yeah. will they? Yeah, the interviewer asked Powell about the trillion, trillion with a T, trillion dollar coin. And Powell said, yeah, that's a, we, we don't have yeah. that. Well, 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 no, nah. we're not going to play these games. <laughs> Maybe he's the adult in the room. I don't know. but I think he might but be. But let's hope that calmer heads prevail, a little negotiation, a little give and take, and it gets done. And we don't have to worry about it for a little while. Yeah, I think we're going to have to worry about it for a little while, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> I unfortunately agree, Mike. <laughs> Dominic, we're out of time. Again. And uh, I'll see you down the road, and good show tonight. Good show. Great evening, all. Be safe. Have a good night, everybody.